just to start off with, obviously, Patsy yeah. is a role you've gone back to after many years. Um, was it easy to get back into the Patsy role? It wasn't so many years, because we did about three episodes, which came out during the Olympic year, 2012. So this is only a little gap of, what, three, four, three years since we made it. And in the middle of actually shooting the series of Absolutely Fabulous, there were five years we didn't do any th anything at all because Jennifer just didn't feel like writing it. So we, we've had a quite a spasmodic go at it, but it has spanned 25 years. So now Patsy is rather like, um, rather like one of those Dracula coffins, which <laughs> out she comes, you know. And she's quite easy to get into because all she does, you know, once the hairs aren't right now and the voice goes down, you get the smoke in, you're there. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and it's a truly international success, isn't it? I mean, I mean, presumably, I mean, wherever you went before, presumably you were recognised. But this must have perhaps taken it to another level. This is pretty huge. It's, um, I think that we were we were even anxious when we did the pilot that maybe people in the north of England wouldn't know about Harvey Nicks being in Knightsbridge <laughs> or whatever. You know, we thought maybe they won't get it. But once we were hearing that there were, you know, truck drivers in Arizona saying, "What about those two English broads?" and you realise that it's got longer legs than that. It doesn't work in translation. So subtitles, which must be gruesome, but nevertheless are much better than revoicing it because they revoiced it in France and it, all the humour was sucked out of it. Somehow you have to hear us. So have you heard yourself being dubbed by somebody else? Well, I sounded terribly chic. <laughs> 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 um, we're going to talk a little bit more about your kind of acting career, but we'll start off with Tale of Two Cities, because in a way this is kind of where it began. So this was a film that you chose as your screen epiphany. Was there anything else that you had thought of before Tale of Two Cities, or was it one you immediately thought of? I wanted to pick the film that made, made me know that I was going to act. For a start, I felt that I was so like Dirk Bogard to look at <laughs> that I could be mistaken for his sister. I mean, I was about... I think I was about 11 when I saw this film. Now, I just want to put it in, in context. My parents, my father was um, a soldier who was with the Gurkhas, and he and my mother had gone back to Malaya. My sister and I were at boarding school. And during um, the spring holidays uh, of 1958, so exactly when this film came out, we were staying with either guardians or <coughs> godparents. And we were taken to Seven Oaks to see Tale of Two Cities with Dirk Bogart, who I can't remember whether I'd seen him in... Um, I don't know, The Spanish Garden or something around the same time. But anyway, he was already a bit of a hero. Uh, I suppose I was homesick. My sister and I were pretty much on our own. But anyway, at the end of this film, which utterly, utterly appalled and shocked and engrossed me, we sat, we were unable to be moved from our little seats. And the family we were staying with went out and got the car and brought it round to the front of Seven Oaks Cinema. <laughs> and kind usherettes picked us up and our tear-stained fronts and off we, <laughs> off we went outside. And it was absolutely awesome. It had such a huge impact. I had nightmares about the guillotine from then almost up till now. It seemed the darkest thing. The bravery of the film, Louche Sidney Carton, who suddenly turned at the end. And there's always something rather marvellous about somebody who's a bit of a shit doing something fine, <laughs> doing something as fine as this. Um, sacrificing himself not only for somebody else but for somebody who loves the girl that he loves this is the, the knots that dickens can tie your heart into i was overwhelmed to take this story on so i decided to become an actress and be mistaken for dirk bogart <laughs> um why the first no stop you <laughs> stop because it just i've got to go on to the end of this no, no that's absolutely fine life rolls on and i've become a model and i want to become an actress and i don't know how to become an actress i've done commercials but you couldn't get an equity card unless you'd done 42 weeks in rep i hadn't been to drama school blah i went to a party and there was handsome and huge screen star and great shakespearean actor richard johnson and bravely i went up to him and i said mr johnson i want to be an actress and i don't know how to make the hurdle because i can't get an equity card and in those days, it was a closed shop. If you didn't have an equity card, you couldn't act. And he said in a gorgeous, silken voice, I'm in a film at the moment. If I get them to cast you or something and you say a line, you shall be in the film. I said, oh, thank you so much. I love that. <laughs> Lo and behold, he was as good as his word. The film came along. It was called Some Girls Do, starring Richard Johnson and the great Israeli actress, Dahlia Lavi. I went in. My line was, yes, Mr. Robertson. <laughs> it's the only line in my entire career I can still remember. <laughs> and I got the part in the film, and who was directing it but Rafe Thomas, who directed this. Wow. And there, 
was Richard Johnson, who was divine, who'd linked me into this. The plot goes on round, because in this film is Christopher Lee, who I had adored as a child watching these things, who later, twice, I've played his wife, once a victim and once two wives of his in films. <laughs> Dirk Bogard, who is my absolute hero, I got to the stage where when I was writing, I used to write for newspapers as well, used to do as much as I could. Used to do everything, all rather badly, but loving it. He became a friend, a pen friend. I interviewed him. So stick with life. It's stranger than you think. That's amazing when you think about you know, the young Joanna Lumley at that time, watching the film in the cinema, with no all these years later. No connections, and suddenly knowing, knowing everybody. <laughs> what I didn't do at the start, which we often do at Screen Epiphanies, is find out... Um, who in the audience has not seen the film before out of interest. You want to put your hand up? Mm. So there's a, a big spoiler that um, <laughs> Jeff Hunter has shown. But you might know the Dickens source, of course. Yeah, you must. Um, you have to know the story a bit. But what was interesting, too, was reading, because I, I wanted to read up. I haven't seen it since that day. I haven't seen it since I sobbed my heart out. But the memories are bright. It was in black and white. And I read yes. that Rafe Thomas debated about this, JJ, didn't he? Tell me what he thought. Um, well, I, I'm, I'm told at the time, I mean, you, you may know um, best than I do, but I'm told at the time he felt that because it was written in black and white, he wanted to film it in black and white. And, and, you, and you could argue it's, it's better for that, but I think later on, from a commercial point of view, he felt that probably it should have been in colour. That's as I understand it. Is that right? I think it's right. And also, do you remember that time when colour photography came in? Everybody, oh, dear, we're in black and white. We want colour. And guess what? We're all going back to black and white. Our favourite and our most important pictures of ourselves are usually in black and white. And I think that this film, with its dark central theme, works best and will endure longer for having been shot in black and white. So good for you, Rafe. And there, were, there were, had been many versions in terms of, in the, in the silent period, I think 1917, 1922, 1925, and then 1935, yes. more famously. And, and, and it's continued to be a kind of favourite, more than a sort of TV movie. But is this something you'd like to see um, made again? Or are you happy well, now with this? Th th they're, they're remaking stuff. I mean, I, d I did a series on television called Sensitive Skin not very long ago. And lo and behold, within 10 minutes, they've remade it with, you know, they'd recast it. And you kind of go, mm, great, no, I'm thrilled. But you kind of think, oh. Still, yeah, it's just, it's still there. It's still available. But as this passion for remaking goes on, and I think Shakespeare, probably, you know, the big books like War and Peace can be remade and remade, and I think Dickens can be remade and remade, um, and maybe it's time to do another Tale of Two Cities. It'd be lovely to, to see, those of you who haven't seen it, to see this extraordinary, violent, dark, bloodstained story of great heroism and great love. Um, and it was written by this, sorry, was gonna, the, the screenplay was T.E.B.Y. who wrote a lot of the Ealing comedies, like the Titfield Thunderbolt and Hue and Cry and Pass Watch Pimlico. Yes. Um, and and it's, it's good writing. Good writing. And tight. All the films in those days, there was no, no self-indulgent kind of mooning or staring. You said the lines. You got the plot going on. You can see it was made for £320,000, which sounds, I mean, even when you go back and multiply up, by the however many hundred times you do it since then. But nevertheless, that's not a lot. But that was the most expensive British yeah. film made that year. Yeah, it was. Yeah, very, ex very expensive by those So standards. although they were using, they were shooting in the Loire and they were using the army, I think, to be that's extras. That's right. The extras were was a, a, a base in, um, in Orleans, I believe, and, the, and all the soldiers came over as extras. That's right. And they worked every hour God sent and they shot the whole movie in six weeks. And sometimes I think that um, a hard taskmaster and high fences and a small purse make for very good films. We don't want too much indulgence in our business because we run away with it. We but can't resist it. <laughs> and, and before this, Ralph Thomas had made the Doctor's films with Dirk Bogart yeah. and continued to work with him con you know, over a period of time. Lovely I mean, partnerships. These partnerships can't really exist in a rougher, harder world. Today's world is so... It's got its eyes on the... Well, I suppose it always did have... It, it's worked out exactly who's going to see it and how much cash they'll make in the first weekend. And So everything's bent towards the money. And I wish that we could get back to bending it towards the story, the film, and hope people like it. And if it's mildly out of time, i.e. it's past its sell-by date or before it's seen by date, bear with it. Y artistic adventures must not be trammeled by money. It, it's a, it, money's the wrong taskmaster. And in our country, in our Western world at the moment, it seems to be the god, because the gracious people we seem to admire, those who are the or the ones who are written off with the most slavish devotion and admiration, are always the richest. I, I touched on before in the introduction about the fact that your career has covered lots of different areas in terms of modelling and writing and acting and campaigning and so forth. And I, I, is there, are there any of those that you feel most comfortable with, or actually have you, have you enjoyed having all those different 
multi elements. I loved it. I loved. I was only a model for. I stopped modelling when I was twenty one. So <coughs> I mean, it's so long ago. It's fifty years ago, practically. I'm seventy this year. So it was fift almost fifty years ago. But nevertheless, modelling has stayed behind me because I gave Patsy a modelling background. Because of modelling, I'm aware of cameras and I understand lighting. I understand lenses. Um, so I never minded having been a model. I was always too keen on st knowing stuff to shut up and just say my lines. So I love doing my documentaries, and I've made about 13 documentaries. And the last one I've just made, which comes out at the end of this year, is about Japan. But the, the thrill there is of meeting different people around the world. That's a very different discipline, though, isn't it? A acting and being given a script, and then having to be yourself in front of a camera you know, in the Trans-Siberian Adventure or meeting Will I Am or mm. Elvis, whatever it might be. I mean, mm. I, I, do you not find that difficult, actually, being yourself or just in the camera? No, because I'm a very poor actress. And so, <laughs> what, the, th the, no, the truth is the matter is you just, you just are... There are two ways. One is a character actor where you have <coughs> marvellous noses or different wigs and people go, my God, that's fantastic. Do you hear her voice? It was extraordinary. You couldn't tell it was her. And the other uh, is the kind of... And I mean this with all the admiration in the world, the... Clark Gable, George Clooney, which is what you want. You go to see George Clooney. You don't want him to shave his head and have a limp. <laughs> you want him to be George Clooney. And so that's probably the category which I belong in several rungs down, that people never expect me to be very different, except on the radio, where I did a very good German voice and nobody knew who I was. <laughs> so you, that was nice. You directed um, a short film for Sky Arts as part of their Little Crackers mm -hmm. uh, project. Was that something that you enjoyed? Would yeah, you do that again? It. I would. I wonder if I've left it too late. I mean, you always think, particularly as you get older, and you're probably beginning to lose your marbles slightly, you think you can have a go at almost anything. Then you think, well, why not? And if you've got the chance, why not? And I found that I loved acting. I love working with actors because I know them, and I know that the more you ask of them, the more they, you can do. I've always adored technicians, so when we were doing films, I would always hang out with the electricians or the cameramen or people who were making props to see how, it, how they did it and what their lives contained and what made, what made something work, how sometimes less is more and sometimes shadows mean more than richness. Do you know what I mean? A s light coming through slatted blinds. You know, think of Hitchcock. and They didn't seem to have money. It's lighting and integrity. When um, some of the shows that you've made, like New Avengers or Sapphire and Steel, have kind of over years kind of acquired this kind of this cult kind of label attached to them, and when you were making them, did you ever have a sense that these would be <coughs> kind of long-lasting programs? Well, the Avengers, I, I was the last one on the, on the line of the Avengers. So it was three lots of the Avengers and then the new Avengers because they brought in a younger man because Patrick by then was about 50 or 60 or something and he uh, didn't want to, couldn't, you know, so got gorgeous guy was hunting. And um, I'm sure most of you today might have even heard that Bert Kwok has gone. Oh. Did you hear that? Great Bert Kwok, the great, great actor in Cato. And I had the great joy of fighting with Cato in one of the... Pink Panther films, but um, but to go back to these things that uh, that have sort of become cults. Sometimes you think it's a cult because it was so long ago. Sometimes, like Sapphire and Steel, they were genuinely, yeah. rec you know, they broke the ice because after that came the X Files. After that came um, all the slightly science fictiony people, people from another planet. But Sapphire and Steel, Sapphire and Steel have been assigned two glittering balls spinning around like this. But for little children, scary beyond belief. I was terrified by that yeah. program. I, I don't know, I was even that young, to be honest. No, but it was frightening. They were frightened. They dealt with dark stories. Very good. One, one thing you're also known for is your kind of your campaigning spirit, and particularly around sort of the Gurkhas and Nepal and, and, and animal welfare, recently the Garden Bridge. Um, is that something you think that regardless of the direction your career's gone, you would have been a sort of campaigner anyway, or is that something that you've been able to do because of the platform that you can bring? I never really saw it as campaigning. It's really just helping out. Um, most of the stuff I do, which is, you know, the charities. I've got many, many charities, which I love to support in whatever way I can. But if you stop calling them charities and just see them as something that needs something doing, you stop feeling going, oh, well, I've got my, oh, I've done, I've done my charitable work. Or if you don't think of it like that, and you just think, well, I could do that. I could do that. But the Gurkhas, I mean, that was well, proper that was campaigning, wasn't well, it? Well, that was different because that was something which was a huge... Um, a, a blot on our country and successive governments had had let the Gurkhas slip through the crack because they're not a Commonwealth country the only country, it's the most extraordinary relationship, born out of the bloodiest battle in 1815 um, and the Nepalese soldiers came across to the British treading over the dead of both sides and said we admire you, we'd like to work for your army 
And so they've volunteered for our army over 200 years and have been completely the most faithful and truest friends. And to find that they were deported the day that their 20 years service to our country, laying down their lives, they were deported, seemed terribly wrong. So when I was approached, there were only four, there were three human rights lawyers, the man who was a, a counselor from Folkestone Council and uh, me, and we were the five. And they asked me because they knew that I had the useful thing about celebrity, if that's what you want to call it, fame, is that cameras can follow you. And if you stick your dyed yellow hair up above the parapet, people can see you and they'll go, what's she up to? And so you can draw attention to something because you need that. Without the oxygen of publicity, their story would never have been told and the campaign would never have had the success it did. And more recently, on top of all the other things, comedy has kind of come through a lot more with, we were saying about Ab Fab, but also yeah. things like you know, David Williams and Friends uh, show that you did last year and so forth. I mean, is, is, is that something that you're really kind of happy that you've been able to sort of tap into? I that? love it. I mean, Patsy was God, godsend. But uh, the very first job I ever did on television was a Jilly Cooper series called, called it's, awfully ba it's Awfully Bad for Your Eyes, Darling, about <laughs> four girls sharing a flat. And it was a comedy. Uh, and I, I was always a clown at school and a fool. I actually always had to play men in the school plays because I was tall. So I got quite used to moustaches. So patches and moustaches, not being mentioned here. <laughs> um, I love comedy. I always love it. I've done a, I've done a f few stage comedies. But most actors, you know, the second you're doing something, your eyes slip over and you go, God, I'm on this telly thing. I wish I was doing a movie. When you're doing the films, you go, oh, God, this is, these hours are so unsatisfying. You're flat out. You get no audience reaction. I wish I was in the theatre. The moment you're in the theatre, you go, oh, my God, eight shows a week. Why can't I get up and do a telly? <laughs> so we go round and round, mumbling and grumbling. I adore it. And, <laughs> and I know that it's always very sort of easy never to say never, but would you go back and do Patsy again if Jennifer continued to ride? In a nanosecond. She needs a sharpish stick. She needs quite a lot of jabbing to get going. And do you do some of that jabbing? I do plenty of jabbing, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, are, are the plans to continue beyond this? Or is no, it just no, no, no. But, and it actually is up to Jennifer, because if she feels like writing more, then maybe we'll write more. It, she's almost certain not to, She's certainly not going to write another series. Um, and I don't know whether she'll ever write another series. I don't know whether she ever wants to bother, but I bet she does. Maybe when you start jabbing in a couple of years' time. A little jabbing, and I open a bottle of whiskey, and she says, I don't want it, and I say, you do. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so... Before, before we finish, just so we can just go back to Tale of the Cities now because we're about to watch it. Yeah. Is there anything that we haven't talked about you want to sort of share before we put it I on? I want you to see some film? of the great, great, extraordinary actors Rafe Thomas had got it, had picked for the stable. Not only Dirk Bogard with Dorothy Tutin, but their names like Cecil Parker, yeah. um, the Donald Pleasance, Donald Pleasance Christopher, Lee, yeah. <laughs> Christopher Lee, Christopher um, Lee, Alfie Bass, yes, you said that, um, uh, Rosalie Crutchley, Athene Siler extraordinary, great, classic British actors in this greatest of my early films ever. This is the one indelible, cut my heart open, and it says, Evremond. No, it doesn't. I'm going to start crying again. <laughs> Thank God I brought a hanky. Get your hankies to the fore for the end. And the last lines of this film, which are written by Dickens, but directed, Jeremy and Jill, by your daddy, I think are done in the tenderest, the most beautiful way. We've got the great privilege of Rafe Thomas's children being here. And it's so fantastic. I've got to say, Jeremy, when you stepped through the door, I went, oh, it was Rafe. But it wasn't, it was you. Wow. Well, that's a fantastic way to sort of start off. Now, we're going to watch Tale of the Cities. A huge, huge thank you to Joanna Lumley. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Joseph.